Well, now, long before Corbyn mania, so-called, a wave of anti-austerity began sweeping parts of Europe. Greece was at the forefront of that, of course, with the election of left-wing Syriza. After his election in January, the Greek finance minister was Yanis Varoufakis. He became about as close to a celebrity as many politicians get. But after seven months of fierce negotiations with Greece's creditors and the European Union, he resigned. Well, Yanis Varoufakis joins me now from West London. And a very good morning to you. And as I mention anti-austerity parties, what parallels do you see between your own Syriza party and the Labour Party in the UK under Jeremy Corbyn? There are some uh, broad similarities in the sense that I believe that uh, uh, the body politic, both in Greece and in the United Kingdom and elsewhere in Canada, as it turned out uh, quite recently, uh, have had a gutful of the old style of politics, uh, of the assumption uh, that uh, the weaker members of society uh, must uh, suffer the costs of a crisis to which they contributed nothing at all, and that there is no alternative other than a continuing diminution of prospects for the majority of the people. That is the comparison. But on the other hand, we have to be vigilant about the uh, great differences between Greece and generally member states of the Eurozone and Britain. Britain, fortunately, for Britain and maybe for the rest of us, is not part of the Eurozone. So uh, in this country, uh, the forces of progress face quite different challenges and also have access to levers that are lacking in places like my country back home in Greece. I want to ask you about that because it was the great, uh, well, maybe unanswered question, but let's hear it uh, from you. You said there, fortunately for Britain, it's not in the euro. It was never part of Syriza's programme that Greece should even think about leaving the euro and then have control over your own currency and uh, all the devaluation and other levers that you could have at your disposal. Well, it is important to draw a very sharp distinction between, on the one hand, the verdict that we should not have been in the euro. Um, it, this was a, a view that I held in the 1990s, and I lost a lot of friends in Greece uh, due to my opposition to our entry in the eurozone. But we need to, as I said, we need to distinguish this sharply from a, the view that we should get out. The point I'm making is this. We should not have entered, but once we're in, the path that led us to the Eurozone doesn't exist anymore. So if we try to back up to reverse along the same path, we will fall off a, off a cliff. Exiting a monetary union is an utterly hazardous operation. It's the equivalent of uh, announcing a devaluation many, many months before it takes place. So once in, you have to stay within and try to fight as hard as you can, maybe default within the monetary union, uh, in order to extract from Brussels and from Frankfurt a decent uh, agreement um, uh, to, to, to reframe the, the, the terms of your presence in the Eurozone in such a way as to make it possible for the debt deflationary spiral to end and for some glimmer of hope of uh, recovery and growth to return. Uh, Mr Varoufakis, what do you make of the uh, UK as it debates its future within Europe ahead of an in-out referendum. I mean, your analysis is that uh, the EU is anti-democratic, that it's uh, run by authoritarian technocrats, yet you feel that Greece should stay in it. Many in Britain make that analysis, but by and large, they're the ones that want to leave. Let me be brief in my assessment regarding the referendum in this country. You will not find many politicians who are as scathing about Brussels as I am. At the very same time, my message to my friends here in Britain is stay within and campaign as strongly as possible in order to change it. Retreating back to the nation state is not an option anymore. Britain is simply going to find itself still constrained by a malfunctioning European Union without having any capacity to influence it. And secondly, let's face it, the moment you step out of the European Union, 
the constitutional problems of uh, the United Kingdom are going to flare up uh, and they are going to distract this nation from the task of uh, regaining its poise, looking after the incredible uh, failure with productivity, with investment, with creating decent jobs for the people of Britain. Uh, and think of the person in the pub, the man in the pub, as I say, who now uh, scapegoats the European Union, blaming Brussels for everything. What is he going to blame everything that will go wrong on after that? And I uh, just wanted to ask you about uh, Portugal. You will have seen, uh, as we talk about the spread of anti-austerity parties uh, in Europe, uh, the Portuguese president refusing to appoint a party that uh, won a majority because of its anti-EU rhetoric. Uh, do you interpret that as anti-democratic? Well, this is just another example of the crisis uh, of European democracy. The rules of uh, the Eurozone are impossible to implement because the whole monetary union was ex exceptionally badly designed. Unfortunately, Europe is in denial of this. And the greater the failure of those rules, the greater the determination of the bureaucrats uh, and the politicians who are serving the bureaucrats rather than vice versa, to implement these rules, and the only way to go against the laws of nature, if you want, is to become increasingly authoritarian and for the democratic deficit to become greater than ever. Uh, th th this is why what Europe really needs now is a surge of democracy. What it needs is uh, a movement of uh, uh, well-thinking, reasonable European Democrats to demand from the bureaucracy, to demand from their politicians that they start respecting a very simple idea and a very simple principle, the principle of democracy. And lastly, uh, more advice uh, for the Labour Party, as I said, uh, sharing some of your anti-austerity analysis. What about its method of campaigning and this idea, as Syriza did, of energising a new base, perhaps an anti-politics base, using social media and other non-traditional methods? Look, there's no doubt that the media, and of course I, I, I accept you <laughs> uh, from uh, uh, this judgment, the media have been quite toxic in uh, the way that they've covered uh, our campaign for a modicum of rationality and of you know, economic reason. Uh, it is as if they were behaving uh, in a totalitarian fashion in support of policies that were absolutely impossible to justify. That was the situation in Greece. And uh, unfortunately, I see that uh, there is also a tendency in this country uh, to undermine the quality of the conversation once Jeremy Corbyn appeared on the scene. Let me just give you an example. The way that he was lambasted for his idea of a different kind of quantitative easing, uh, people's quantitative easing, when effectively what he was doing, he was reviving uh, a monetarist agenda. Um, uh, even Friedman, Milton Friedman had talked about helicopter money. The way that the quality of the dialogue is being jeopardized by a media which is uh, absolutely keen to bring down any radical voice that seems to be stepping out of the beaten track. This is detrimental to democracy and uh, my advice to Jeremy Corbyn and actually to every any, any conviction politician uh, is just ignore the media, uh, articulate a reasonable position, put it to the people and if you've done your job properly at articulating a reasonable position, in the end the people are going to, uh, the citizens are going to respond to it and then the media will have to follow. Okay. Mr. Varoufakis, fascinating talking to you. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Yanis Varoufakis there, the former Greek finance minister.